John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation in celebration of the 35th anniversary of the MacArthur Fellows Program, which recognizes ex exceptionally creative people who inspire us all. And now, please welcome to the stage, Jeff U. Boys. Good evening. Thank you very much for coming. My name is Jeff Uboys. I'm a program officer with the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation in Chicago. Tonight's performance is in honor of the 35th anniversary of the MacArthur Fellows Program. We'll be having a performance with Jesse Little Bill Baird, who's co-founder of the Wapanak Language Reclamation Project and Kennedy Center Artistic Director Jason Moran. Tomorrow night, we'll be having a second performance here at the same time with George Lewis and again Jason Moran in a performance at 6 p.m. We hope to see you there. Thank you again very much for coming. Thank you for coming. My name is Jason Moran, and this is my good friend, Jesse Little Doe Baird. And I might say that this conversation that we're gonna have, which is about language, it's about not only language in music, but language in, in culture and in history, and how we both um, decide to mind the language and look for clues. Um, but Jesse's story is really a powerful one, and we met at a MacArthur Fellows gathering maybe six years ago, and I never forgot sharing dinner with her and hearing her talk about this story of, of resuscitating her tribal language, which had been extinct for how many years? About 150. 150 years. So, you know, I kind of, maybe just to kind of like pull back, you know, to that moment we were just talking or just share with us again, um, like how, what is the genesis of, of, of finding this clue and then then what, what unfolds afterwards? Um, I, th I think the genesis of the work um, had its place sort of long before I was born. Um, and our story of language coming home is really a part of a larger um, Wampanoag um, prophecy. And my piece in it was um, in 1990, Two, sometime in 1992, um, I had a series of um, visions. And um, a vision, it's you're not asleep, but you're not awake either. Um, and it's um, idiosyncratic in the way that if you think it's a dream and you, um, maybe an uncomfortable one at that, don't want to have it again, it will if you make yourself completely um, cognizant of your surroundings, when you're in that state again, it will pick up where it left off, and so it won't leave you. Um, so I had um, some visions about um, language coming home, but in those visions, um, I entered into a room um, it took several days to have the vision. I'm not going to talk about the whole thing because some of it isn't necessarily language related, but I um, entered into a room um, that was maybe four or five times the size of this space we're in. And when I entered the space, um, there was a large circle of Indian people from all different tribes and they were circles that made a circle. And they were chanting something continually. Um, and what the first group chanted it, and the second time they said it, the second group sang in, and then the third group sang in. And I went along the outside of this large circle until I came back to the top of the room, sort of would be in this position. And it was, my own people, and they weren't people that I readily recognized, but I recognized their families. I'm from a tribe of about five families, so even if you don't know someone, you can kind of tell which family they come from. They have physical features of their family, their clan. So there was 
a circle of people from clans in my tribe. And instead of being happy to see them, for some reason I got very afraid. And I said, okay, well, something's going on here and whatever it is, um, I don't feel like I have a place here and I'm gonna sneak out. So I made myself really small <laughs> to try to sneak out. Mm -hmm. And one person said, um, they had a book spread across their laps and one person asked another, but what does this mean, what we're saying? What does this mean? And um, the other person said, ask Jessie, she knows. <laughs> I was caught and I thought I was sneaking out. But um, <clears throat> so a long, real long story short, um, that just sort of lit a fire um, inside of my soul um, that left me obsessed with um, bringing language home. And so that's Did what you I share that with someone else after this happened? Um, no, nope, not for a while. Um, I didn't want anyone to lock me up anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, not for, for a while, um, I did not. Um, but once I had sort of passion on board, and passion and love is really what it takes to get any decent thing done after all, once that was on board, um, I started doing some research and then I would have more visions that would, um, and my own people would tell me, go and do this now. Oh. And if you're willing, go and do that. And, and so that's how the work started. Would you be having the visions during, like, I mean, I mean I'm just, first, I mean, there's many things for me to pause on before I <laughs> ask you another question, but I, one, a room that's five times the size of this space, uh -huh. but one of this circles, a circle of circles, uh -huh and then of tribes, and then your people, and then the moment when you as an individual citizen, you know, minding your own business. Trying to. Trying to mind your own business. <laughs> and now you've been given this, maybe a duty, or mm -hmm. you know, a calling, or, because did you ever feel like there was something that was driving you that way before this, this moment? No, actually, um, my career was working with homeless families and battered women. Um, I was a social worker. Mm -hmm. I never thought I'm going to be a linguist when I grow up. Um, but it was such a driving force inside of me that I left my work. Um, I went back to graduate school and finished with a Master of Science in Linguistics at MIT in 2000 because you have to have some training right. um, to work with these languages. So, um, but um, yeah, I. And this book, this long book. So the book, it turns out, now I didn't know that, I did not know at the time I had these visions that we had the most heavily documented American Indian language on the continent. Mm -hmm. I did not know that. Um, I didn't know we were the first American Indians to use an alphabet to write our language, mm. and I also didn't know that the first Bible put to press in the New World was printed in Wampanoag in 1663. Wow. Um, and um, I'm, I, th I think that that book was the story, the collection of letters um, and, and um, petitions for redress of wrongs and injustices petitions against child slavery, asking King George to help us all the way from then forward. There are these documents written in my language from my own people, and I think that book was that. Um, and I think that my people, in order to thrive, not just survive, but to continue to thrive, we have to understand that book, which is that history that comes from our family's voice, and not from um, pilgrims that came here in 1620 on the Mayflower and started right. documenting history. Right. <clears throat> I mean, you have to give me a lot of moments I'm, mm. I, because I'm, I'm not a professional interviewer, <laughs> but I'm, a, I'm still, re I'm reeling. Um, but then how does it become a point where the language then stops? Mm. Um, so, when, um, when the English first came here, they're on a resource to get material and resources 
and take them back to England for sale. And they were funded by the New England Company. And one of the things in the, um, the New England Company was, there was no New England yet, was from actually in England. And um, one of the things that became obvious was that there was going to be a problem in that there's, there are already tribes here. So right now today, with a lot of tribes having been killed off since 1620, there are 567 Native American tribes in the United States today. So there were triple that at one point. So people come here to do business and get resources and tribes say, well, but you can't just cut that off. And so, so um, clashes start, clash of culture, clash of, philosoph clash of philosophy, et cetera. Um, and they had the idea that if they could get the indigenous people here to be more of a like mind, maybe they wouldn't fight so much. And missionaries felt that they were called to come here to give people Christianity because they didn't have Christianity. Mm -hmm. And they felt that in, in b Christianity being given to the indigenous people here, um, if God wanted us to behave a certain way and get along, then it might be easier for everybody. And so the missionaries had two choices. They could either try to teach about 40,000 people in Wampanoag territory anyway to speak and read English and then try to convert them to Christianity, or they could translate all of the religious materials into their language. So in order to do that, they needed Wampanoag people to do that, and that's where the writing and the language began. <clears throat> A lot of what I'm also thinking about um, and why we're having this conversation is, is how, as a jazz musician that looks at eras of jazz, piano history, let's just say the piano, for okay. instance, and piano repertoire, which has hundreds of years of people writing things about it. There, you know, so Bach, we don't have a recording of Bach, you oh. know, playing those pieces, but we do have it written down. And then how does one then decide, as a performer, how to play the piece, mm. right? How do you play the piece? So, right. like, how do you, like... How do you speak the piece? How do you speak the piece? That's written down. That's a really good question. Um, so, Wampanoag is one language in a family of 40 languages. And that family is called the Algonquian family, and it's the most widely dispersed geographic language family on the continent. And some languages have six dialects. So Cree, for example, there's six dialects of Cree. There's two dialects of Wampanoag. So a lot of these languages were not outlawed. So I'm from a tribe east of the Mississippi on Cape, what is now Cape Cod. And the tribes east of the Mississippi have been exposed to um, European culture um, for about 400 years. Tribes west of the Mississippi, a little over 150 years. And a lot of those com communities um, still don't see outsiders very often. And a lot of the languages in this family are from both sides of that river and are still spoken but they all come from one mother originally, which is amazing. Um, just like um, Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, French, they all come from the same mother. There are all very regular sound changes that take place, say, between Portuguese and Spanish. Um, so in the same way, there are regular sound changes that take place between Wampanoag and its sister languages. So um, if you know what the a vowel is in um, Passamaquoddy, for example, and somebody wrote I, O, and U all in the same word, you're not sure what the vowel is, you can look at Passamaquoddy in Maine that's still spoken and make the corresponding sound change and know predictably what the vowel ought to be. Mm. So that's part of the reconstruction work. But, but the, the funny thing is, though, um, a lot of people don't know that um, in the 1700s, in the 1600s, there was no such thing as a dictionary. It just didn't exist. So the rule to spell anything was spell it any old way you want. So you can find a word spelled 20 different ways. Um, that can get to be a challenge. But um, So I just I standardized the spelling system and um, I started it on a dictionary in 1996. And right now there's about 12,000 entries and um, there's still a long way to go. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. Okay, I'm gonna, now I'm gonna play something. 
Okay. I'm going to play something in, a, in another language. Um, because I spent a lot of time tra as a traveling jazz musician and hearing languages that I never understood. Uh, let's say Turkish. This is the first piece I'm going to play is in Turkish. And then I would start to record people's conversations. Or I'd ask a friend who was spent the day with me showing me around Istanbul. Okay, so, you know, like, recount the day for me in your native tongue, you know. Just as a way for me to hear it rather than simply by the news or I'm in a restaurant, you know, uh -huh. or someone is introducing the band and Mishlak Soiga, which is a drummer for Jason Moran, you know, uh -huh. uh, you know. So like, so I wanted to start to figure out how language felt in my hand that I didn't understand, you know, um, and where would I start to figure out where was syntax, uh, where was phrasing, you know, is it personal to the person's voice or is it for everyone who speaks the language. Okay. And I started trying to fig figure this out for the piano because in the piano there was just a w different ways of touch that I wanted to figure out. There were very small nuances that happen in language that don't really happen in kind of like regular music repertoire. Right, like the, the age of the speaker. What do you mean the age of the speaker? Um, a friend of mine learned to speak Kiowa, um, but he, his teacher was in his 80s. And so he became a very good Kiowa speaker, and he started talking to some other graduate students that were Kiowa, um, and they just really laughed their ass off. They said, <laughs> your, your pitch, your tone, right. everything sounds like an old man. The age of the speaker. <laughs> learned from the old man. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna play this piece. Um, and this is, this is called uh, Ringing My Phone. And this is after a day spent in Istanbul. Uh, and a friend of mine, Ahu Gural, she kind of recounted the day, you know, the things we had seen. But then she gets interrupted by a telephone call from her mother. So you hear the phone ring, and then you'll hear one side of a conversation that she has with her mother. Uh, so this is Ringing My Phone. Şu an Jason'la birlikte otelin odasındayız. Işıklar harika. Türkiye valla bayağı karışık. İstanbul'daki insanlar garipler ya anlayamadım. Çocukları soymaya çalıştılar bana. Telefonum çalıyor. Ringing my phone. <gülüyor> Efendim anne. Oturuyoruz anne. Yani duymadım ben hiçbir tane telefonunu biliyor musun? Şimdi gördüm. Otelin otur oturuyoruz odasında. Konuşuyoruz yani. Şu an sesimi çekiyor alem ya. <gülüyor> sesimi çekiyor hani müzik yapmak için demiştim ya ben sana hatırlıyor musun? Ya çok komik ya olamaz öyle. Bütün kapalı çarşı Sultan Ahmet, Topkapı Palas, ay Topkapı Sarayı. <gülüyor> Hepsini hep de gebenim hani daha yeni yemek yiyor. <gülüyor> Elma yiyorum da. <gülüyor> Onlar da bir şey yemedi. Onlarla birlikte akşam yemeği yiyeceğiz. Üç kişi, iki arkadaş daha vardı yanında. Taksiye sığıştık dört kişi valla. Ha, güzel güzel ya. Ha, çok hoş. Yani en başta gördüğüm zaten şok oldu gibi böyle. Ha, ondan sonra şey birazcık ne bileyim. Ya anlatırım şimdi ses çekiyor ya korkuyorum ileride. Hani. <gülüyor> Hadi çeviririm böyle. O yüzden. Ha, tamam. Merak etmeyin ben Nur'da kalacağım. Ee, Nur teyzemi ararım ben olmazsa. Tamam peki. Ben cebini açık bırak ben seni ararım. Ta I will call you. Okay. <gülüyor> tamam oğlum. Ee, say to hello. <gülüyor> Bye -bye. O da aynı şekilde hello de. <gülüyor> Hadi öptüm. Görüşürüz. Şu an Jason'la birlikte otelin odasındayız. Işıklar harika. Türkiye valla bayağı karışık. İstanbul'daki insanlar garipler ya anlayamadım. Çocukları soymaya çalıştılar valla. Telefonum çalıyor. Ringing my phone. <gülüyor> Şu an Jason'la birlikte otelin odasındayız. Işıklar harika. Türkiye valla bayağı karışık. İstanbul'daki insanlar garipler ya anlayamadım. Çocukları soymaya çalıştılar valla. Telefonum çalıyor. Ringing my phone. <gülüyor> Şu an Jason'la birlikte otelin odasındayız. Işıklar harika. Türkiye 
Valla bayağı karışık. İstanbul'daki insanlar garipler ya anlayamadım. Çocukları soymaya çalıştılar bana. Telefonum çalıyor. Ringing my phone. <gülüyor> Şu an Jason'la birlikte otelin odasındayız. Işıklar harika. Türkiye valla bayağı karışık. İstanbul'daki insanlar garipler ya anlayamadım. Çocukları soymaya çalıştılar bana. Telefonum çalıyor. Ringing my phone. <gülüyor> Şu an Jason'la birlikte otelin odasındayız. Işıklar harika. Türkiye valla bayağı karışık. İstanbul'daki insanlar garipler ya anlayamadım. Çocukları sormaya çalıştılar. Telefonum çalıyor. Ringing my phone. <gülüyor> Efendim anne. Oturuyoruz anne. Yani duymadım ben hiçbir tane telefonunu biliyor musun? Yani duymadım ben hiçbir tane telefonunu biliyor musun? Yani duymadım ben hiçbir tane telefonunu biliyor musun? Yani duymadım ben hiçbir tane telefonunu biliyor musun? Yani duymadım ben hiçbir tane telefonunu biliyor musun? Yani duymadım ben hiçbir tane telefonunu biliyor musun? Yani duymadım ben hiçbir tane telefonunu biliyor musun? Yani duymadım ben hiçbir tane telefonunu biliyor musun? Yani duymadım ben hiçbir tane telefonunu biliyor musun? Yani duymadım ben hiçbir tane telefonunu biliyor musun? Yani duymadım ben hiçbir tane telefonunu biliyor musun? Yani duymadım ben hiçbir tane telefonunu biliyor musun? Yani duymadım ben hiçbir tane telefonunu biliyor musun? Yani duymadım ben hiçbir tane telefonunu biliyor musun? Yani duymadım ben hiçbir tane telefonunu biliyor musun? Yani duymadım ben hiçbir tane telefonunu biliyor musun? Yani duymadım ben hiçbir tane telefonunu biliyor musun? Yani duymadım ben hiçbir tane telefonunu biliyor musun? Yani duymadım ben hiçbir tane telefonunu biliyor musun? Do they, do they, do the, so the languages that you're <coughs> applying, pitch, tone, melody, mm. do you think you could tell the difference between two if you did that several times, just hearing the piano? What do you mean, like? So the feel of that language, right. Turkish, the, the way that oh, right. feels and right. sounds, if you did that, say, with, I don't know, Urdu or some other language, do you think that you could Hear, just hear the piano by itself right. and then say, okay, I know where that comes from. Okay, so I'll do Mandarin. Okay. Right? I'm going to do Mandarin. And this is from a, uh, this is from a stock report in like the late 90s. <laughs> really? <laughs> so, yeah, so, so they say things like Infospace. Does that company even exist anymore? Or, you know, uh, kind of, you know, it's very short, right? And so this is Mandarin. But this is also, but like also in this one, I think it's also place too. It's like where, you know, like what's the setting for okay. then the conversation. So you hear this, this, this pitch of this woman giving this report is in a frenzied setting. It's on Wall Street. Right. You, okay. It's not necessarily <laughs> everyday vernacular for that one. Yeah, yet. but it's okay. like, it's in, in stylized for television, mm -hmm. right? So, Got it. Right, okay, so here's, here's uh, info space. 在这个客人放不到电话销售新旧电话手机接待的时候昨天可能展馆是购买现存的这些产品那个在下一代的新产品出台之后而等到下一代新产品价格稳定之后再考虑能大手的消费所以在这期间呢他们就认为可能在下一
you know, or the nickname you made. D A R A D A. Oh, that's my grandfather. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anthony Benet from Tony. Always oh, put. That's deep. My <laughs> grandfather, like, coming out of the speaker. <laughs> He's watching you. He is. Oh, my goodness. I got to call him tonight. <laughs> so he showed up today. <laughs> but, yeah, but, like, but I kind of thought about that, too, which was, is, is then, like, what is the settings and how do we use, so, so how do you teach kids to use it in the setting? You know, how mm -hmm. do you teach uh, uh, your elders to use it in different settings, Very like, different. in the kitchen, okay, so, mm -hmm. well, the, or in the car or... You know, how do you start to feel like, feel, feel, figure out those nuances of the language? Um, I, I, so one of the um, things that you have to do is um, meet people where they're at, not where you're at or where you think they should be. So we have had classes where we get together and we make dinner or we make, we have a cooking contest. My cousin Sherry and I both love to cook. You might have people competing their favorite recipe, but you do it in Wampanoag. You might have a group of boys that want to play basketball and you sell it. You actually market what you're doing and say, hey, you could have an advantage over your opponent if you learn to call your plays out loud in Wampanoag. <laughs> you can do that openly and they like that. Right. Um, or you might have elders that um, really just want to be able to pray and give thanks in their language. Right. And that's what you do. You meet people where you at, you know, I, I think one of the most poignant things for me was there was um, a time in 1998, I think it was, um, one of my young cousins, I said, hey, you know, you should come to language class and check it out. We're doing it these nights. And, um, and she said, well, I would come, but I don't do very well. I didn't do very well in school. And um, I had an IEP and I was in special classes, and uh, I don't want to come to language class and be embarrassed in front of any, anyone. And I said, look, just come and hang out um, and visit. There's good food, and I won't call on you, and um, you might enjoy yourself, or, or maybe not. So she came, and <laughs> she was really good mm. in language class. And um, one of the things that we're supposed to be able to do in my culture is to present ourselves when we die. When we die and go home, we're supposed to be able to present ourselves in our given language. And for a long time, we couldn't do that. And um, about eight months into her learning, um, she got really sick. She was uh, 23 years old, I think. Absolutely beautiful, gorgeous woman. Um, and she was sick for a while before she went to the doctor, and uh, she had stage four cancer, wow. very sick, new baby. And um, myself and I and a group of women went to visit her at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston, and she had asked us to come up. And um, she was laying in her bed and really physically unrecognizable. And she said, you know, Jesse, um, I just want to say how grateful I am because um, I'm going to die. You're not going to see me again. But when I die and I go home, I'm going to be able to present myself now. And there are a lot of people that are a lot smarter than me that can't do that. Mm -hmm. But I can do that. Mm -hmm. And I think in that moment I really realized that um, language is such a gift from God and such a blessing that um, you take people where they're at and um, um, tell you put together a few minutes of a video or talking to people about where they're at and what it brings to them. Maybe we should, yeah, maybe maybe we we should check that out. It's about 10 minutes. You guys want to see that? Okay. <laughs> Katapatanu 
ליפי וניקק, אדמה עניין, אסינת ליפי סופוואק. Growing up in Boston, I knew that I was Wampanoag, but never knew what it meant to be Wampanoag. And as I got older, I started questioning, you know, I'm walking around telling everybody I'm Wampanoag, but what does that mean? And it wasn't until there were classes offered in Boston to take the language that I started to get like a glimpse of what it meant. And when I started taking the course and they had, um, there was this handout <clears throat> with the prayer for every time. And learning the prayer, going over the prayer, rehearsing the prayer, um, I think really kind of spoke to me. Um, and something about it just felt like, oh, like, you know, but so that's what got me interested in language, taking the classes. I wanted to start learning the language because I wanted to start being more culturally involved. Um, I grew up, uh, I didn't grow up with the tribe, so I, uh, once I started moving back, um, I wanted to get more in touch with my family. Um, I didn't know much about my culture at all, so I wanted to get more involved. I originally thought of taking a language because I wanted to be just able to, to introduce myself, um, say thank you or a greeting actually. But then when I started taking the course, it, it, I became really very interested in um, the different, um, different particles of it. This, you know, it, it, uh, it makes more sense actually than English when you, when you break it down. Um, so um, I was kind of hooked. And I feel like what I've learned is being connected um, to things that, you know, as you know, a kid growing up in the city, you don't really think to say I'm connected to this thing, like the land, to say that you're connected to the land. And not only are you connected to the land, but you're connected to the people. And so that's one of the things that I'm, I'm learning is that I'm connected to, to things that, or to people that I normally wouldn't, you know, think that, you know, I'm actually connected, connected with. Um, and then secondly, um, what the language has taught me about the culture is just to be honest, you know, and to be respectful. And, to, and these are things that, you know, I think you learn coming up, you know, in character, you know, um, education, you get that. But to be able to uphold that and be proud of that, be proud of the fact that, you know, when you see an elder or you see, I mean, just another person in life that you honor them, not just because they're your elder or just because, you know, they're someone you know, you, you respect them because they're here and you respect all the different walks of life. And for me, another part of that is <clears throat> with animals. I never really was like really an animal person, um, but to understand what it means, you know, to eat the meat or to eat these creatures, but also be able to give thanks for what they bring to your life, you know, as sustenance and nutrients and things of that nature. Learning the language definitely um, opened my eyes to just the whole culture and the way our ancestors thought. Um, everything is in such detail and it's just, it, it's, a, it's amazing to, to go back to the simple way that we all thought as opposed to how colonized we think now. Like, um, like the word Um Our ancestors were trying to um, translate the Bible, and they kept talking about this hell. Hell, what is this hell? We don't, we don't believe in hell. So the way that they thought was, oh, what is the worst thing that could happen to us? What is the worst thing that could happen to our people? 
Now, some people thought that their whole being was in their heart. Some people thought that their whole being was in their head. We thought that our whole being was in our head. And what is the worst that could happen to us people is if we were brainless and we couldn't think, we couldn't feel, because we, we feel everything is in our head. So what is the worst thing that could happen to us is to be brainless. So the word chipayakamakwa is the empty skull place. It's not this place that some religions think are this hell with fire and this and that. It's just like for you to be empty, to know that these people came from out of nowhere telling us we had to learn you know, this way and we had to learn to act this way and we had to learn to believe this way. And we not having our own, like our, not having that same understanding, had to come together and say, okay, this hell, you know, this is a, a really bad place. You know, what would be a really bad place for our people? And legit, when I think about that and how Jesse kind of explained it, like, it's the place of the empty skulls. Like, you know what I mean? To not really have a heart, to not really have, you know, a spirit, to not really have understanding of who you are. Like, you know, like that is hell for us. Learning the language has definitely opened me up to the culture and it's, it's amazing to, it's amazing to learn. And this is why I feel like you have to learn a language. Like we have to be able to share this language with all who are willing to really receive it because you don't really understand like the depths of the understanding our ancestors had you know what I mean? Until you really break down the words, like "kui kwasin," it's not just "good morning." It's you are in the light, like you know. So the, it's that type of understanding that I think really. That's what that's what we need. So it's great to know the language, but the second, but the other part of it is understanding. I think that the, the variety of uh, teachers uh, also helps because you get a different a different angle. Uh, from, from each different teacher, you get a little a little something different. So, I um, and I, I enjoy enjoy the classes very much. Um, I look forward to to Tuesdays and Thursdays. I I've always longed for the opportunity to to teach in a way that really connected and made a difference. Um, and I think that being able to teach the language to Wampanoag youth, like you know, and Wampanoag children was definitely something that it, that is fulfilling. And even as I'm learning, I'm like excited going forward because I can take what I'm learning and adapt it to my own teaching style and share that with the young people. And I feel like that's a big, that's a big part that I felt was missing. I'm not in this world that I really don't fit in. I'm in a world where I belong. I'm in a place that I belong, where the children look like me or vice versa. Watching my son learn the language has been, a, it's, it's amazing to watch, um, especially now that I'm starting to learn the language. Uh, it's great that I can, I can communicate and we, because he doesn't, he didn't really know much about it now that he's learning, but before I was kind of like, oh, you and mommy have our own secret language, da, da, da, you know? So he was, he loved it, he loved it. Um, and he loves the songs. He is all about learning songs. But it's, it's, it's amazing watching how fast he picks up and how just the words just flow out of his mouth. So it's, it's, really great to be able to communicate with him and now I'm starting to be able to communicate with others um, with some elders and and it's it's great uh, I think it's great that the elders <coughs> elders are learning the language uh, but it, certainly if we had started it earlier and, and we we were conversing with each other um, it would be it would be more meaningful but i think for the children i think it's very important it's great and i can't wait to see all these other kids that grow up with the language and then they can teach their kids or their classmates or whatever and then we'll it's just just thinking ahead of how great it's going to be 
that our language is going to be revived, completely revived one day. I always felt like I knew I wanted to be a teacher. I knew that's what I was doing, you know, at the time. Um, but I never thought I would be teaching the language until it became real. It's just, I feel like this is where I need to be. Like, I never felt like anything was missing until I got here. And I thought, this is where I need to be. This is what, everything that I had been through, this is what it was all for. And it's just, it's such an amazing feeling knowing that, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna start paving the way for little leaders that'll be speaking Wampanoag. <laughs> 400 years ago, you know, was the last time Wampanoag teachers were in the classroom with Wampanoag children. And I, to this day, don't know how to, like, express um, what I felt in that moment reading that. Like, you know, it's amazing, like, you know, to be able to, to realize, like, the position that we're in, you know, with the knowledge that we have, with the understanding that comes with learning the language. Um, it's definitely something that I think is monumental um, and, and necessary um, to sustain, you know, our people. Great. Great. You know, you have this uh, wonderful board here, yeah. um, and we saw you in front of the board. Mm -hmm. And earlier, you kind of demonstrated a word for us, you mm -hmm. know, and you broke it down. Yep. Could you break down oh, sure. some language for us? Okay. We're going to play a little game here, actually, turn this into a quick game. So um, one of the gifts of language um, and language reclamation is the information that it brings to you. And this language, like many other languages, is called agglutinative. And that's just a really big linguistic term that means it's got lots of little parts stuck together in a certain order to make meaning. So I'm going to put a word up here. I'm going to tell you what the little parts mean. And I'm going to see if someone can guess what that is in English, OK? Okay, can everyone see this or I don't know if you can. Is there any way that the audience can see this word? Can you see it? Okay. So this bit right here means store away. My printing's terrible, so you'll have to forgive me. And it's also put away. This little bit, oh, and the word is pronounced aniquas. Everybody say aniquas. Very good, very good. This portion of the word means on purpose. You're gonna do something on purpose with your body as opposed to I tripped or something. Doing something purposefully. This portion of the word, um, this U is actually shared between these two morphemes, but this portion of the word means um, that my back faces the sky. So that means I'm sort of oriented this way as opposed to this way. And us means I am not a two-legged creature could be three, four, five, six, but I'm not too like it. So I store away or put away things on purpose with my body. My back faces the sky, and I'm not too like it. Any ideas? What did someone, I heard somebody say, not squirrel. No. What's the other word? No. No. No. 
Wait, say that again. Bear. Nope, not a bear. What? Bear. Nope. Bear. Not a snail. <laughs> what was it? Bear. Nope, not a deer. All very good guesses. Tell me when you want the answer. <laughs> what is it? Somebody said it. Nope. Nope. Somebody said it, though. Nope. Somebody said it. It's our friend, the ant. <laughs> That's an ant. So now let's try another one and see what we can figure out. Can everyone see that one? Do you want to try to pronounce it? Moshaniquas, that's right. So Aniquas is there. There's our friend Aniquas we just learned about. And now we have mush, Moshaniquas. And mush means giant. <laughs> so I am the giant one who stores things away with my body on purpose. My back faces the sky and I'm not two legged. Who am I? Again, nope. Nope. Somebody said it earlier. I think we went through the whole animal kingdom, but someone did say it earlier. No. There it is. That's right. It's a squirrel. <laughs> now, you might not think that these guys are related, but they really are. So now the final question is, and this is one of the things that's amazing, we can learn about the flora and fauna history on a land by looking at language and looking at meaning. So knowing that we have Aniquis, the ant, and then we have Mush Aniquis, the squirrel, who was in the neighborhood first? How, how, how do we know it was the ant? That's right. So the mush is a modifier for the base, and the base is an equus. So we started with an equus, and then the squirrel hit the neighborhood later. So in, in some ways, um, we can teach children in the community about flora and fauna, looking at language and the history there. Um, so that's what we were talking about earlier. Yeah, I love that. And maybe... Uh Talia is a student, you're a student, a student of Jesse's? Yes, and she, Talia also made the video that we just saw. And maybe I'd like to invite her to the stage to just talk briefly, or maybe ask you a question about kind of, you know, as the student, you know, like I thought it was nice that someone, one of the elders said it's nice to learn from different people because they get different persons, mm -hmm. a teacher's perspective. Mm -hmm. And so kind of like you as a, as a student and new, you know, new speaker, like, how, what's this process like for you? What is it like? Um, it can be stressful sometimes, especially when we go into immersion and it's all Wampanoag and no English is bad, very bad. <laughs> <laughs> so that gets very stressful and frustrating. But it, it teaches you so much that it's so enriching and you just want to do it. You just thrive to do it. And the more you get into it, the more you're just like, oh, it all makes sense now. So it does start to get easier, but at first it's really that powering through it, like, no, that doesn't make sense. That's because that's not the way that English teaches you how to think. But what Wampanoag does teach you is how to rethink about the world and how our culture is, and it teaches you so much about the culture. And what I found interesting about even making this video is these two people were from far away from their you know, reservation land, their homelands. Me, I'm not, I grew up there, I left for college but came back. Like, so it's something that has been a, a part of my life forever. So they gave me insight on what it's like to be somebody coming home to the language and some, they didn't even, some of them didn't even know that language wasn't, uh, Wampanoag wasn't spoken. Mm. So that was very interesting to find out too. But I also had to explain to them that a lot of people in our community, they love it because it teaches them so much, but we also have some people that it, it's, it's weird because it's like, hey, this is part of your culture. 
that you didn't know for so long. Mm. This is it. And it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa, wait a second. I didn't know that. I've, I'm all about my culture. You know, I've been living it my entire life, and now you're going to tell me that there's right. a language that I didn't know about? <laughs> so right. getting past those, those sort of attitudes has been a bit of a struggle, at least in my family, because I'm one of the only people in my family that's starting to learn it. So. Mm. But at the end of the day, when I tell them even just little things about one word or another word, they're just like, oh my gosh, that's so, that's awesome. Like, right. it makes sense. It makes completely sense. And also a big thing that I want to mention about the language is how much it does teach you about your culture, but it teaches us about ourselves because a lot of people don't know outside of Native American communities that we struggle with a lot of things, especially with self-identity and knowing who we are and learning the language and figuring out how they got that word, why it, why it is the way it is. Even the word for woman, matamwasas, it made me realize what it is, you know, struggling to find out who you are and why doesn't things make sense and why do I get treated this way and why don't I understand everything is because we're missing this part of our culture mm. that is so enriching and it teaches us. And it, when you learn it, it's like it all makes sense now and it makes it's full circle, and it's amazing that it's coming back home. <laughs> that's beautiful. Give it for Talia. I mean, that's awesome. Sorry, that was lengthy. That's beautiful. <laughs> no, because, I mean, I mean, I was struck by that that part because it, in in in the world that I live in, like a lot of it's handed down. You okay. get to spend some time with someone, and then they pass pass a phrase of music to you, um, and those phrases become very sacred, you know, yeah. to a degree too. You also don't just freely share them. Either like they become part of you, and then you learn how to say them in yeah. your own way. And so, I also know it's like a very, also a private thing that right now is starting to become more, you know, in your community it starts mm -hmm. to kind of build like, like a, you know, a momentum, you know. And you know, we we were talking kind of earlier about like how a language can change over time. Like so, jazz the way, you know, Scott Joplin sounded in the 1800s versus like you know today. what I play like today. But we still know his song, but how would I play his song? I didn't think about like how I was asking kind of like, oh, so what are the kids going to come up with? Because the kids are going to come up with some, some slang mm -hmm. for some, for, for, for a woman or for a man mm -hmm. or for a shoe or, you know, you know, like how will that then start to like impact the language that this new kind of, uh, you know, neighborhood speak might right. even start to happen or yeah. in the family. Like these are the things I wonder if you're already picking up on. Yeah. Um, one, I heard um, one kid say to another, in a Facebook uck. That means like he sent me a Facebook message. <laughs> the Facebook uck. Like, whoa. Um, yeah, they the, already here. say, yeah. You know, um, I, there's one thing I wanted to do before because we are getting close to running out of time, but I asked Jesse to, to recite a poem in Wapanak for me. Mm -hmm. and, then I, and she sent me a recording of her <laughs> reading this poem, and maybe could you tell us what the poem is before I perform along with it? Um, so um, the poem is about bupuhunik, and bupuhunik is our word for drum, and it means um, the instrument that goes buh bu from here to here. Mm. So it goes buh buh buh, and it's named bupuhunik, and um, for us, um, the drum is sacred because, um, as you heard Camille saying in the video, um, we believe that our soul has its seat in the brain while we're here on Earth. And so um, everything that comes from creation, the place where we, we were created in the universe, in, um, comes into our brain um, and then through our hands or through our feet if we dance or if we make, we make ceremony. Um, and then when men particularly use the drum, they send their connection back to creation, their message back to creation. Um, and men need the drum more than women because we bring babies, we bring life. So mm. our umbilical cord connects us here and the men are connected there by a larger drum. So mm. that's what the poem is about, that connection between the spirit, the mind, um, and the drum, and then back to creation. Mm -hmm. And the poem is called? Pupu Hunik. Pupu Hunik. Okay. I think I called it Pupu Hunik. Right. OK. <laughs> yeah. So this is, this, is, this is still, I'm still working on it. But I figure 
you'll forgive me for, for working on music. You ayung Nashawi Masamata Ak Masakisa Kahuamayak Pupupunik Ontabu Wapan Sipu Nayutak Kakikatu Gon Atakanan Napah Tanamui Wanita Panamui E. Tompan Kananak Napion Tamawankan and Onash you are Kwana Tucker. Watch Kikya Onku An Matapat An Manachikanan An Pupu Honekanan Ka Pakwa Jayuat Pamashamo Wami Katanon Chamuankanan Ka Katana Konsumankanan Onash Kananamish Nashpi Kuamonikan Ka Pupu Honekanan at chikwaiwi nu kaiwi ai wonkna ta wachonman ki sakwi na twana tamwonkna ni kono hajik patas mwak wachi no chamwonkna jik patas mwak wachi no chamwonkna jik patas mwak wachi no chamwonkna The last That's word really is a notch, which, which means let it be this way. Right. Yeah. And I think another yeah, let it be this way. Mm -hmm. Amen. You know. Like. It's like saying amen. It's whatever was just said. Right. Um, let it let it be that way. Right. Yeah. That um, was beautiful. This is the beginning. I mean, ever since we had a conversation a long time ago, I have not stopped thinking about this relationship to to words and phrases spoken a long time ago and then how they manifest today. Um, and I want to thank you for all of this amazing work. And I want to thank the MacArthur Foundation for introducing me to you. <laughs> I want to thank selfish. you for inviting me. It's been really a lot of fun. It's been an honor to be invited here and um, to get out there outside of my community and just talk to people about the beauty and importance of language, not just my own, but language, the importance and beauty of it. A notch. Right? A notch. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>